Well, I, I hope you heard what Tiffany said as she's baptizing Bailey. A mom baptizing her daughter and says, you know, when she hears Jesus' words that say, go into the world, making disciples and baptizing them, that starts not in this universal, huge, global movement that starts right here in the home. That, that really was the thunder. That's the point of the message this morning. As we talk about body life, we we're talking about more than what happens at church. We are not talking about body life so much. We're talking about the life of the body and what that means. And in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul does an incredible description in the first chapter of what it means to be in Jesus Christ. And just even if this is review for you, just listen to what he says about this goodness of God and what's offered through his son. He says, in Christ, you are chosen. He, he, he wants you. In Christ, you are adopted. You are beloved. You are the object of God's desire and love. In Christ, you are completely forgiven. There's not a sin that escapes him. There's nothing hidden from him. Not in a fearful sense, in a redemptive sense. There's not one of those sins that you've ever or ever will commit that will crawl away from his finished work. You're redeemed. You are purchased with a price. You're graced lavishly. Grace by its nature means abundance and to lavish. And yet when we see Paul describing it, oftentimes in the scripture, he can't get around the superlatives with grace. Grace upon grace. He says his intentions are kind. C consider that for a second. God's intentions, God's desires for you, they're kind. Man, if we just believe that one thing, let alone all these others, if we just believe that one thing, if the world could just fathom that God was kind, not exacting, that God is not demanding, that God is not some divine cosmic authoritarian that lauds his power over people. Instead, through his kindness and his goodness, he draws people. He's a lover. It says that we have an inheritance in him. And then Paul gets to chapter 1, verse 15. And he says this. For this reason, all the things we've just mentioned, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you, grant you, a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Paul is praying that we would understand through the power of the Holy Spirit just how good God is. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. That God has a purpose with you. He has a desire for you. And it doesn't matter what gender you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your political persuasion. It doesn't matter your belief systems. It doesn't matter your gifts and talents or lack thereof. God has set his sights on you and he loves you. Verse 19, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe these are in accordance, in agreement with the working of the strength of his might. His power and might all come together to convince you he loves you. Which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he ends this passage, chapter 1, with this incredible statement. And he put all things 
in subjection under his feet. God put all things in subjection under Jesus' feet. He's gifted Jesus with the authority because of who Jesus is, the perfect reflection and representation of the heart and character and person of God, specifically towards you. And he gave him his head over all things to the church. Which is his body. We're doing body life this morning at a church. Because the church, the called out ones, the ecclesia, have been called out from among the world unto God. And church now is described as the body of Christ, the fullness of him him who fills all in all. If I was going to summarize this whole passage and all that we've heard in it and say, what is Paul saying? Because he's saying some unbelievable stuff. It's going to be really deep. It's going to be really theological. You're going to have a hard time grasping this. But here it is. God loves you. There's there's nothing more to convince you of. There's nothing more to say to you and to me than these three transformational, incredible words. I think if we're really honest this morning, when we think of body life, we think of church, we think of things that happen for two hours on a Sunday morning, and while it includes that stuff, it has never, ever in the heart and mind of God been limited to what we're doing here this morning. Yes, as a family of believers, as a family that came to to kind of like a family reunion today, We got to see new members of the family. We got to hear how they became members of the family. We're going to celebrate later and eat with members of the family. Maybe the most important part, right? We're going to have, this has been like a family reunion. So it would be really easy to see why we can get duped into thinking that what, what we're talking about when we're talking about body life happens at this place only, but that would be wrong. The church is not a building. The church is a people. The the church is not these four walls. You know, if you came in here on a Tuesday afternoon while nobody was here, except maybe Mandy and Kevin and Jay and Frank and Emily and Catherine and Roberta, not me. If you came on a Tuesday and it was empty, you would have walked into an empty building that you would call the church, but it would represent nothing of what God talks about when he's talking about the church. See, what makes this place special is you. And you'll spend two hours here, maybe three today. If you're really hungry, maybe four. And and then you'll leave here. And you'll go into your communities and your homes. You'll go into your workplaces. And if you think that body life, the life of this body, stops then, you would be sorely mistaken. The whole intention of what God has accomplished is that he would communicate his love, not just to you here, but through you there. For God so loved the world. Otherwise, all this becomes is a social club. And and please hear what I'm saying. Many people believe that's what church is, where everybody talks the same, looks the same, acts the same, believes the same, and that's what God is pleased with, and nothing could be further from the truth. God is pleased with his son in people. So you may say, but Tim, you, you don't understand. I, 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 I hear what you're saying. It sounds good, and I'd like to believe it, but I'm going to go home, and then it's, it's a whole different set of circumstances here. I mean, nobody's playing worship music for you live at home. I mean, can you imagine if Jesse and the team could just follow you around and play worship music for you wherever you go? Uh, You might have a, a, 
iTunes and you might listen to that stuff, but I'm talking about having real people do it for you. Can you imagine how different that would be? What if Frank followed you home? And what if he was able to parse the Greek and tell you what these verses are saying right in the moment when you're struggling with what is that verse saying? How do I relate it to my kids or my neighbor or my uncle or my family? Do you realize, how many times have you walked out of here and then in the middle of the week thought, wait, what was it that meant so much to me on Sunday at 1030 that now I can't even remember what they said? If I could only remember, and we can feel completely inadequate, but you heard what Pastor Frank just said, because of Christ, God has made you adequate. And he's placed the Holy Spirit in you, his people, the church, not a building, a possession of people. And he's placed Christ in you. And and this is what Romans 8 says, that the Spirit testifies with your spirit that you're a child of God. You don't need just what happens here on a Sunday morning. You have enough in Christ. You may feel unworthy. You may feel like you have nothing to offer. You may feel like you don't understand Galatians like Pastor Frank. You may feel like you don't know what to do, but your feelings don't determine the truth. You have Christ in you. Oh, maybe you're saying, you know, body life, but Tim, I don't want to serve in the kids' ministry. Have you ever worked with four-year-olds? I've not worked with them, but I've had some. And I, I can tell you what I was hoping when they were four, that they'd get to five, six, seven, and eight. So I understand maybe you don't, you're not called to work in the, the, the kids' ministry. Maybe you're not, sorry, Emily, it's just true, right? Maybe you're not called to the nursery. I get it. Maybe you're saying, oh, the youth ministry, Jay needs a chaperone to, with teenagers on a trip at the beach. I'm not called to that. It's okay. That's church work stuff. It's good. It's valuable. Don't get me wrong. But body life isn't limited to that stuff. You have what it takes. So this is not about doing church. This is about being the church. And ultimately, the church is loved ones. You're loved. God loves you. This is not just what we need to know. This is what the world needs to know. For God so loves the world. In Romans chapter 5, it says an incredible thing. It says God demonstrates presently. God is active in his demonstration of love right this moment. In this unchangeable fact. That while we were still sinners, while we were still opposed to God, while we didn't know his love, while we rejected his love, God died for you. This is what your neighbor needs to hear. And and please, please caution. When I say needs to hear, I'm not talking about you need to be telling them or using words all the time. This is what needs to be shared with all people is that God loves them. And sometimes that's shared with words and oftentimes it's shared without words. It's a life expression of the body of Christ. That's who you are. This happens wherever you go. Too many people think that the church is, is, exists to try to convince, coerce, or to convert people. That is not our job. Have you ever tried to do that, by the way? Have you ever tried to convince somebody? Have you ever tried to coerce somebody? Have you ever tried to convert somebody? It's miserable. I was talking with my mom one day about some of these incredible truths. She was a believer, but I was still trying to convert her to what I was believing about being a believer. And I badgered her so ma- so much, not because I was upset, but because I loved her. I so desperately wanted my mom to understand some of these things God was showing me. And I would badger her with it. And she finally, not so politely, asked me to stop. Don't share that. She was not saying, don't share the love of God with me. She was saying, stop trying to do it like that. The world is loved by God. So body life has to include much more than church. 
Sunday morning. See, God's love is what places value on us. People you work with, people you interact with. If we're really honest this morning, which can be a struggle when we're trying to look right, if we're really honest, we would admit that our struggle is really knowing that God loves us no matter what. When we fail at parenting, when we fail at pastoring, when we fail at our jobs, when we fail in our families, when we fail out there somewhere, when we're so exposed, I think if we were really honest this morning, it doesn't matter who we are or where we come from, what we desperately need to know is that in spite of all of that, somebody loves me. Well, God does. And his love places incredible value on you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, it says, Do you not know that your body is a temple and you are the dwelling place of God and you are not your own anymore? Somebody, God, purchased you. He bought you. He paid a price. God determined that you had a value on you and he was determined to pay it no matter what the price was. And the price was Jesus Christ. So do you understand what that means? That when you go through your daily stuff and you go, I feel worthless. I feel like nothing. I don't feel like I can compete or compare with my neighbor or my friend or even my enemy. When all those things happen to us and there's circumstantial evidence that seems to dictate to us that we are worthless. God with a resounding unfinished I mean, finished, unchanging work because he died for you, says you are worthy and it's because I've placed my love on you and God's love makes all of us worthy. He determines your value. You can't do that. No degree can do that. No opinion of anybody else can do that. No success in business can do that. No failure in business should do that. There is nobody, nothing, no circumstance, no experience that has the right to determine who you are and how you're valued. God alone has that right. Because he really knows. And when we are loved like that, and start to believe it, we begin to experience something different. When Caroline, my oldest, she's now 17, but when she was, when she was a little bitty girl, a little toddler, she had as her prized possession her night-night bunny. Your, your kids have something similar. It's, it's Linus's security blanket, right? She had to have this bunny. She dragged that thing by the ears, and she took it all around. It was a white bunny when it started, and it was a brown bunny when it ended because it was got dirt from the dragon on the floor, and when it got a hole in it, man, it was, it was like all hands on deck. We got to sew this thing up because if we lose that bunny, I mean, this is, this is how she went to bed at night. This is how we got her to eat. But there were times where we'd go on a trip and, and she would leave the bunny somewhere. And I'm telling you, it didn't matter how many miles you had traveled, you were turning around because Caroline loved that bunny. That bunny was more valuable than gold. If you'd have asked me as her dad, would you rather have that bunny or a million dollars, I would have told you Caroline didn't know what a million dollars would do for her, but that bunny she loved. When we love something, when we are loved by someone, it places tremendous value. Even this, sorry Caroline, even this worthless bunny had infinite value in the lover's eyes. You have infinite value in God's eyes. That is not limited to anything about you but it can be expressed through everything of you. This is why Jesus said incredible things like, do you know that when you know my love and when you know where I live, that you will do even greater works than me? That passage has always confused me. Has it you? I mean, consider it. Jesus raised the dead. 
Jesus healed the sick. Jesus caused the blind to see. Those are amazing enough. Jesus has gotten a hold of me. I mean, when we consider the works of Jesus, and then Jesus said, but do you realize you, and he's talking about the church, the body of Christ, you will do greater things than me. He was telling us that while he was able to do these incredible things by dependence upon the Father, he was limited to a place in Palestine. He had a geographical limitation. And you may say, well, so do I. Well, of course you do. But look how many eyes are out there. There's a lot more of us than there were of him. And his spirit indwells us. And he's saying, do you understand that the same power that, G- that lived in Jesus now lives in you. And it, it was able to resurrect the dead in him. It will resurrect the dead in us. But if we think that's only limited to two hours on a Sunday morning. Then we have a false idea of what the magnitude of what Jesus came to do is. He didn't come to love just the people in this building. Oh, he loves us desperately. He came to love through the people in this building, his church, to a world that is asking the same questions we still struggle with, even though we know the answer. And he's going, will you share it? See, we don't meet with Jesus through religious observances. How many denominations, how many religions are out there and people think this is how you meet with God through this particular religious observance or or way? None of those are how you meet with God. One mediator between God and man, it's Jesus Christ. Do you realize it's not through the activities we've seen here this morning that we meet with God? That limits relationship with God to religious observances if that's what it if that's what we need then we should be observing all the religious observances no matter what they are no this incredible gospel is that God would meet with us within us and then he would express himself through us to a world that so desperately needs to know him and how much he loves them Our job isn't to convince, coerce, or convert. It's to love. You will do greater things because you are equipped. It says in Ephesians 4, you're equipped for the work of the ministry. Ministry means service. This is not saying you are equipped to do ministry at a church building. Yes, some people are. We're thankful for that. But you'll leave here this morning or this afternoon and and you'll go back to your act of service as an accountant, as a teacher, as a doctor, as a student, yes, even a lawyer, as a salesperson, as an engineer, as a mama, as an uncle, as a retired person. Amen. (laughs) And if you think the call of God to go into the world and make disciples is limited by whatever whatever phase of life you are called into, you're missing exactly how powerful he is. See, that that passage in Matthew, it reads to us, go into all the world. But actually, if we were going to translate it correctly, it would read, as you are going in this world, make disciples. Which literally means, show them that God loves them. They will be a student, a disciple of the expression of love in you to them. Your value and worth has nothing to do with your career or what phase of life you find yourself in. Your identity is not wrapped up into that. Your identity is wrapped up into the person of Jesus Christ. So as you go, wherever you go, you have the unique privilege, opportunity, maybe responsibility, but really 
joy of sharing with whoever's around you how loved they are by God that's in you. Mother Teresa said this, What can you do to promote world peace? An overwhelming idea. Listen to her words. Go home and love your family. That's where it starts. C.S. Lewis said the homemaker has the ultimate career. All other careers exist for one purpose only, and that is to support the ultimate career. Do you see how God has wired and designed us to be a part of a forever family, and he is our father? And he sends his children out into the world. We think the idea of church is get people to come here, invite them here. Jesus says, go there, take the church to them, take your life expression, me in you, to them. And while you're sitting at your desk Monday morning, not because of words, but maybe with words, but because of attitude and actions and this reality of love that's present within you that now can be expressed through you. When you are convinced that you are loved, you will live like who you are and you will be a lover to others. So sitting at your desk, at your cubicle, or wherever you are Monday morning, somebody's going to sniff the love of God for them because you're there. This is what the world needs. This is the life of the body. We get to enjoy it in an encapsulated two-hour moment of time on a Sunday morning, and we get inspired and motivated and energized by it. But then we walk out of these doors, and reality hits us, and we go, oh, man. Let this reality hit you. He loves you. And he loves those that you see around you. And when you leave here and see others around you, he loves them too. And that's what they need to know. That's what they're asking. And it's time for the church, the body of Christ, to allow themselves to be loved and then share that love with those around them. This is what will draw people to Jesus Christ. It is not our fancy arguments. It is not our understanding of Greek words. It is our love for people. This afternoon, right after service, after a couple of worship songs, we're going to have a potluck. That's kind of a church idea, but that's when a lot of people brought a lot of food to the same meal and then... Each of us get to go and participate and take from what everybody everybody brought. And through this kaleidoscope of food brought by all kinds of different people, we share together and we're all blessed. This is the church. That you bring who you are and who you have to the table. Nothing more and nothing less. Simply that you're loved. You bring that to the table. And when people partake with you, they will be blessed. Father, we thank you for this truth. We thank you for this reality that we are the church, the body of Christ. And that you express yourself through us as surely as you did through your own son 2,000 years ago to communicate to the world at large that you love them. You love them. Father, may... May this be so in our lives and may we reveal it to others so that they come to know you, the one who loves us so much. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.